words. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm glad to tell you about uh, some of the work that we're doing in the Evolving Artificial Intelligence Lab here at the University of Wyoming. And you can see a picture of the lab here. Um, but before I get to the subject of the day, which is deep learning, I want to quickly tell you about some of the work that I'm not going to have time to tell you about today uh, that I might be able to tell you about in another uh, seminar series another time. Uh, as was just mentioned, we had this paper here on robots that can adapt uh, to damage. We've also spent a lot of time doing work on the evolution of regular, modular, and hierarchical neural networks, and that's what the NSF Career Award is about. We also do a lot of stuff called computational evolutionary biology, where we basically create simulations of evolution inside of the computer, and then we can ask and try to answer open questions in evolutionary biology. So I'm not going to talk about any of that today. Instead, I'm going to talk about the work that's done by this young man here. Aang, can you stand up? I'd like everyone to see you. So um, this lecture series is in part uh, an opportunity to share the benefits that have been produced by the Tier 1 uh, Excellence Initiative and its funding. And it is currently funding Aang over here to do work. So I decided to do an entire talk that only tells you about the work that one PhD student is doing, uh, and that is Aang. So all of this work has been led by Aang, and most of it has been done in collaboration with uh, Jason Yuzinski at Cornell University and, and myself, as well as other collaborators, but there are too many of those the list. So, um, the overall outline of the talk is that I first want to kind of introduce you to this thing called deep learning or deep neural networks. So, first, really quickly, how many of you have heard of either deep learning or deep neural networks? Let's see about half the room. Okay, so by the end of this talk, I hope to convince you that this stuff is really amazing uh, and revolutionary. And uh, I'm going to spend actually much more time than I would normally in an academic talk kind of giving a high-level overview of what this technology is, because I know that a lot of people in this room have never heard of it before, and I really want to kind of convince uh, all the scientists in this room that you should consider using this technology in your own field, uh, and also the policymakers in this room, that the University of Wyoming and the state of Wyoming will benefit from investing in this game-changing technology. So I'm going to extol not only its scientific, but its economic virtues. Uh, more than I would normally in an academic talk. Then I'm going to um, jump into a more technical explanation of how this technology works, and then we'll get into the science part of this talk, where I'm going to tell you about the work that Hang has been doing to try to understand what these things learn about the world. So, the overall goal of artificial intelligence uh, is that we want to have computers solve problems for us. We want to automate the intelligent things that humans do and uh, have a computer do that. So you can imagine that I might want a computer to be able to see the world and understand it. So a driverless car has to recognize pedestrians and stop signs and street signs uh, and traffic cones. So I might want to input an image and have it figure out what that image is. Like say, lion in this case. Or I might want it to do to translate. I don't know, we're losing some of the slides. Anyway, we want, might want it to translate for us. So I give it Latin and it spits out the equivalent in English or Hindi and Chinese, or whoever it is that we're trying to translate into other languages. So, that's the overall goal of AI, and the spoiler alert in this talk is that it's working now. And the way that it works is via this technology called deep learning, which literally is a computational brain that can solve these sorts of tasks. I give the brain a picture and it says lion, I give the brain cogito ergo sum, and it says I think therefore I am, etc. So what I'm going to tell you about in this talk is how that works. Now, first of all, I want to convince you of how hard of a challenge that task is, right? You guys are all so good at seeing the world. A two-year-old can see the world and respond and say lion in response to a lion. But you forget how incredibly difficult that challenge is. So let's take a look at that task from the perspective of a computer. This is what you give it. This is the value of each of the pixels in this square. And you can imagine how many pixels there are in this entire image. And literally, it's just the red, green, blue value of every pixel in that image. So I'm going to say to Vanessa, here is one billion numbers. And you tell me, is that a motorcycle, or a panda bear, or a person skiing down a mountain? But you wouldn't be able to do it, right? But the amazing thing is that deep neural networks can do that. That's what we do. We give them a sea of data, in this case literally, and they extract out a label such as scuba diving. So think about your own scientific field. Do you have a sea of data that you wish that you could dump into a computer and have it give you meaningful, abstract, high-level answers about 
uh, probably if you're a scientist, uh, the answer is yes. Even if you're a, you know, a sociologist or humanities professor, the answer is probably still yes. So uh, this is what these deep neural networks will do. They'll translate a sea of data into something that you've asked them to learn or glean from that data. So uh, the most amazing thing happened in 2012, and that is that these deep neural networks started to be able to do this feat. And it really has changed the world. So all of the technology that I'm presenting today is, is new since 2012. And it's getting better by the month. So this is an image recognition task. We have a 1,000 different types of images, like pandas, pumpkins, police vans, and ladybugs. And then we ask the computational brain to tell us what it sees in this sea of numbers. And in this case, it says, oh, I'm pretty sure that's a giant panda, but my next best guess is a brown bear or an ice bear. Here, it actually gets it wrong. Instead of seeing pumpkins, it says, oh, those are sunflowers. And you can kind of see why that looks like a field of sunflowers. It's an understandable mistake. But its second guess is pumpkin. Please stand, lady, bug, et cetera. Now, in 2012, deep neural networks could get about 16% error on this task. Humans float around somewhere between 5%, maybe as low as 3%. They train a lot. This year, Microsoft had published a network that gets lower than human, human percent error. 3% error. That means that computers right now can see the world and understand it better than humans, at least with respect to just giving you the answer for an image. It's not true that they're good in general, but on some narrow tasks where we focused a lot, they are better, and they're getting better by the month. That is incredible if you know the history of computer science. So not only can these computational brains see pictures and give you a label, like that's a man or a woman or a police officer, it can actually look into the picture and identify structure and things within it. So here's an image given to one of these computational brains, and it is labeling each one of the pieces of the image to say, oh, I see that that's a bottle of water, that's a cup of coffee, etc." And even more amazing <coughs> is I give it a bunch of pictures where each picture has been labeled by a human with a description, like a caption. Train it on millions and millions of those images. And what can it do? Well, I give it a new picture it's never seen before, and it says, black and white dog jumps over bar. Or girl in pink dress jumping in the air. So this is computers seeing and understanding the world for the first time in human civilization. Not the computers have been around for that long. Um, another amazing thing that's happened, and this is all within the last year, year and a half, is that these same computational brains are starting to learn in a much harder setting. So the previous stuff I told you, I trained the network by giving it an input and an output. So I give it a picture of a lion, and it's supposed to say lion. I give it cogito ergo sum, and it says, I think therefore I am. It's much harder if you try to set a robot in front of a bunch of toys, and you don't tell it what the goal is, or you certainly don't tell it how to do it. You only clap when it puts the square hole into the square peg, or the round hole into the round, round peg into the round hole. Right? So you infrequently reward it by telling good job when it does something right, but you don't tell it step by step how to do it. And these robots can learn to you know, put these pieces into this box. They can learn to play Go and beat the human world Go champion by uh, playing and learning when, what moves lead to successful moves in Go. And they also you can sit them down in front of Atari, and they will just learn to play. So think about how hard that is. You sit in front of Atari, you make a whole bunch of moves. You don't know what's going on unless you're a human, and you just do a bunch of random actions, and eventually your score goes up. You know? And if you gave that to a two-year-old or a six-year-old, they probably, maybe not a six-year-old, three-year-old, they probably wouldn't know, what random actions did I just take to cause my score to go up? How do I backtrack and figure out what were the things that led to success on this task? That's called reinforcement learning, and now neural networks are able to do that. So you sit one of these computational downs in front of Atari, and you have it play Pong or Pac-Man or Frogger, and it learns to play it on its own. And in now, in most games, it is better than a human at doing that. Just figures it out, which is incredible. So uh, I think I only have one more example of what, how these things are so incredible before I start telling you how they work. Uh, this is work from uh, Facebook's AI lab. And I apologize. I have a lot of references to the sites down here, and they're all getting cut off. So. Uh, just trust me that I'm providing appropriate attribution to all the people who did all this excellent work. Uh, so this is work from Facebook, and you take this brain and you read it this text, much like you would read a story to a child. So this is, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen or read The Lord of the Rings, plug your ears. 
You read of this summary, Bilbo traveled to the cave, Gollum dropped the ring there, Bilbo took the ring, Bilbo went back to the Shire, Bilbo left the ring there, Frodo got the ring, Frodo journeyed to Mount Doom, Frodo dropped the ring there, Sauron died, Frodo went back to the Shire, Bilbo traveled to the Grey Havens, the end. You literally could read that to this neural network, or you could input the text, either one. And the neural network says, done reading. Unfortunately, it doesn't say good story, but we're working on that. But then what do you do? You take that brain, and you ask it a question. You say, where is the ring? And it says, Mount Doom. You say, where is Bilbo now? And it says, Grey Havens. Where is Frodo? The Shire. So it's remembering and understanding what these words meant that you just said and answering. And it doesn't just do it by anything that, uh, it's, there's not like kind of a simple structure where it's just looking up keywords. It'll learn what verbs mean. It'll learn what pick up and went to and dropped off and left. What those words mean. And then you can ask it in different words. So you can say, where did, Ro, where did Frodo, Frodo leave the ring? Or where did he drop the ring off? Uh, or where did he forget the ring? And it will still answer sensibly. So it's pretty incredible. All right. So those are some examples of how it does. Who's using it? Well, just within the company of Google, all of your search is now being piped through a deep neural network. It's helping you predict pick good results. When you drag an image in, and it can give you similar images, that is uh, a deep neural network that's understanding the content of those images. It's in their driverless cars. When I speak a bunch of noises, and then it turns those into words, that is a deep neural network that's doing natural language processing. Um, YouTube uses it to recommend things. And when it reads the addresses on street labels, uh, it's doing all of that with the deep neural network. Now, over at Facebook, Jan LeCun, who is the head of Facebook AI, he was a deep learning researcher that Facebook hired away because deep learning is so powerful. He says every image you upload to Facebook goes through two deep neural networks. One of them is to use to recognize faces, tag your friends, uh, and the other one is actually trying to understand the image. So this is an image from my Facebook profile. This is me surfing in Mexico. And I can just tell you, sorry friends of mine who do this that are Facebook friends, I hate it when people post pictures of their food. I'm like, what? I don't care about what you eat. So Facebook hopefully can look into the stuff that I post, the stuff that I like, and say, oh, he never likes this sort of thing, pictures of food. And I can stop showing Jeff pictures of food. Maybe somebody else, like Brett, for example, loves pictures of food, and then we can learn that. But it can't do that unless it understands what's in the image, what the image is about. So that's hard, and they're using deep neural networks to do it. You could also imagine you can figure out who are your real friends versus the people that you just accepted friends requests because you show up in pictures of them, if you're good friends with them, or at least if they're local. This is one of the most amazing things I can even imagine. And this was just posted online a couple days ago from NVIDIA's CEO. So NVIDIA took a car, put some cameras on the car, and had a human drive around for 3,000 miles. The cameras looked out into the world at what the human was doing, what the human was seeing, what the car was seeing, and also got the answer for that situation, which is the steering wheel command and the brakes that the human did. So I have the situation I was in and the human's response in that situation, their action. And it just, they fed that all to a deep neural network and said, do what the human does. There's nothing else in this brain except for what I just told you. This is now a car that has learned to drive and avoid traffic cones, allow its driver to take out their cell phone and not even pay attention. Was there a little over the line there? But pretty good. It's on a highway now. Now it's on a road that has no lane markers. Dry those in the rain, by the way. Here it's on a dirt road with no traffic lane markers, no walls, no other cars, and it's just figuring out, this is what I do. So that is going to change the world. It's incredible. And all of that stuff is being driven by the same technology, which is incredible. Because if you think about it, or if you know the history, in AI, we had 100 different problems, and we had 95 different techniques. And each technique was specifically designed to try to solve one type of problem. And now there's this one technique to rule them all, to make another Lord of the Rings reference. It's like a, a just, just hammer that goes around, and every nail you hit it, you hit, it works better than the previous techniques. It's pretty incredible. 
So here, every major company out there has kind of figured out that this is something that they should be getting involved in, and they're hiring as much as they can all of the talent in the field, and they're deploying this technology, and they're making a lot of money doing it. So it's in IBM Watson, it's in Siri, it's in uh, Yelp in their recommendations and their fraud detection to detect fraudulent reviews. It's used by Tesla in their driverless car, Netflix in their product recommendations, and perhaps one of the most incredible, Skype will do live translation. You want to talk to your friend in China, you don't speak Chinese, you want to talk to somebody in Spain, in Hungary, it will translate live on the fly between the languages that it has trained on so far. This is all the stuff of science fiction, and it's happening right now. So this is uh, NVIDIA's CEO talking about the economic benefits of this technology. And here are a bunch of labs that are doing research in it and companies that are selling the kind of the computers that do the work. But here is the key part. You have tons and tons and tons of startups coming up saying, what can I do with this? And they're just getting tons of venture capital funding. Five billion in venture capital funding so far, over a thousand AI startups. And you've got almost every major company worth their salt that's either already involved or trying to catch up as fast as possible. IBM reckons that this is a $2 trillion economic opportunity over the next decade. Just deep learning. Or at least just artificial intelligence. But at this point, that's synonymous with deep learning for the most part. So hopefully I've piqued your curiosity and you want to know how this works. Let's get into that. So the general idea is that these things are loosely modeled on your own brain, or the brains of animals. So inside of your brain are a bunch of neurons, specific cells called neurons, and they're all wired up to, well not, some of them are wired up to some other ones. And which cells are wired to which cells, and the strength of those connections determines who you fall in love with, what sport you love to play, uh, whether or not you love Shakespeare or prefer to read USA Today, all of that is emergent from this network of neurons in your brain. So computer scientists for a very long time have said, well, we can basically try to abstract how that works. So there's a lot of details in the brain, and apologies to neuroscience. I actually gave a lecture last week to the neuroscience seminar, and I really had to apologize to those people, because we throw out most of the details of what's known about the brain. It's actually a relatively simple abstraction of the brain. We just have neurons, or these nodes here, and they're connected to other neurons. And the way that this works is that I'm going to have some sort of incoming signal on these neurons here. And if this neuron fires, it will send a signal along this weight, this connection here. And there's a multiplier here. It will either get uh, excited, excited or increased or inhibited or decreased. And then that produces an incoming signal to this neuron here. And this neuron will also get some signals from other neurons. And it will decide to fire or not. And then that will go to some downstream neuron. And at the end of that, you get Shakespeare and romantic comedies and a predilection for popcorn and all of that. So the idea is if we can train these things, produce a brain, that may, then maybe we can get it to work something like the brains that we see in animals that do something useful. So this picture I've been showing you here of this computational brain, that is one of these. It's a neural network. But this neural network here has a couple of connections, maybe 10. Uh, but that is, in general, they're much larger in, in this field, and basically that's what happens. And we put in line into this neural network, it looks exactly like this, but much bigger, and it'll spit out line. So here's a picture of kind of what it looks like. You have the input image here. I would have one neuron for each one of the pixels and each one of the colors of each one of the pixels in this image. And it would pass this information through a couple of layers, and then the output would have to say line, so it's a line. So, First, I want to point out the structure of this network. It has an input layer, and then it has kind of these different layers, layer one, two, three, and four. So that, a neural network is just any one of these things. But this is actually, this here is actually a relatively shallow network because it only has three layers. So one of the key innovations that's made this stuff work, and people have been playing with these neural networks for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Now we have them much, much bigger and much deeper. So I can't actually draw each one of the little dots here because there are so many. Within this brain here, this computational brain, is one mil are roughly 1 million neurons, 100 million weights, and 6 to 150 layers. And that's the stuff that was doing all the amazing things I just told you about. We just took the old technology and we scaled it up to a much bigger brain. There's a couple tricks in there, but that's basically it. And then we trained on lots and lots of data, and it works. So how does it work? How do we train a brain? 
So first of all, I now want to tell you why I've been using two different terms for this field. You've got a deep neural network. So this here is a neural, the, the neural network that's deep. And it gets trained by deep learning. So the field goes by two names, either by the field the name deep neural networks or by the name deep learning, because deep learning is the algorithm that takes a random, dumb deep neural network and turns it into a smart deep neural network. So how does this work? Well, if this is an example of a deep neural network here, here are the layers, now I'm doing it vertically. I input the image up here, all the way down here, it has to tell me which of the thousand categories of image that is. I have all of these layers. Well, I put it in an image, I get out the answer. The answer looks like a vector of numbers here. And it's supposed to put out a one for lion, because that's a lion, and zero for everything else. That's what I'm training it to do, okay? So if it spits out this set of numbers here, then what I want to do is I want to, next time I show it the same image, I want this number to be higher, and all of these numbers to be lower. It turns out that this is a giant mathematical equation very, very complicated giant mathematical equation with millions and millions and millions of terms. But I can still do calculus on that, and I can calculate the derivative with respect to each weight in this network. So I'll go to this picture. I can figure out, oh, if I wanted this one to be higher, this thing should have been higher. And then this thing should have fired a little bit more. And that means that these things that come into this should have made this fire more. And I can back propagate those error signals all the way through the network, right up to the fir first layer, and therefore, I figure out how should I change each one of these weights to make it say lion no, more next time and say motorcycle less. That's the overall idea that drives all of this technology. So uh, I'll do that this time. Put in lion. I'll, make, I'll change the weights of this neural network to make it more likely to say lion and less likely to say bagel. Then I'll show it another image, in this case a car. And I say, OK, this time, make lion go be less likely with, in response to this image and make car be more likely. And I just do that millions and millions and millions of times. And then suddenly you can tell me a car and a line, a car from a line. So it's really unfortunate to be cut off. I don't know how to fix that. But in any case, here's the hope. This is kind of the theory and what we wanted to have happen once these things started working. We would hope that at the lowest layer, I'm going to put in a picture of a face here. It's actually Joel's face. And I'll put it on the input layer. And what we hope and think will happen is that early on, it will kind of recognize little tiny parts of the images, like edges. Okay? And so once it learns to produce these edge detectors, then the next layer up might combine these edge detectors into corner detectors, or in this case, I'm skipping a few layers, right up to a mouth detector or an eye detector. And then this layer here, which I'm asking to recognize different faces, will use these features to detect this face. So it's kind of a hierarchical composition of building blocks. And it learns its own building blocks to solve the task at hand. Now, I want to point out, though, that I am showing you a vision example, because we're visual creatures and it's easy to look at pictures. But this same process should happen no matter what you're training it on. So if you're training it to translate Spanish into Hindi, then it has to learn verbs and nouns and phrases and concepts and the meaning of verbs, like picking things up. It has to learn pronouns and prepositions. And it'll automatically kind of hierarchically compose maybe letters into words and words into phrases and phrases into catchphrases, et cetera, all on its own. So I want to kind of quickly show you what, what happened before 2012 for the most part and everything that's happening after. So the old school attempt to machine learning used to be I've got a hard problem, like I want to recognize a car or I want to do something in some other scientific field. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to train a model that can do that work for me. But I don't know what to give this, this little brain here to learn how to do this. So I'm going to handcraft some features. Maybe the features are the number of wheels or the number of yellow pixels. Or maybe I'll, I'll say, I think it should have some edge detectors. I'll make my own edge detectors. I'll apply it to the image, and then I'll take those features and give it to this, train of this, this brain. <laughs> Uh, so the human had to do all the work to kind of figure out what are the relevant features in this image that I need, this model needs to tell a car from a <coughs> jet ski. Okay? The modern approach is just give it the data and tell it what you want. And it learns not only the low-level features, but mid-level and high-level. And it hierarchically composes and figures out everything it needs to know to solve this task. So that's why it's universally able to be applied to all these different problems, because it just figures it out. So, 
this is a really cool thing about these brains, these computational brains, is that they're inspired by real brains, and therefore we could expect that they'll function in similar ways. So there is this Nobel Prize winning work in the 60s, I believe, by Hubble and Wiesel, in which they literally took this poor cat here and they put it in this machine and clockwork oranged his eyes open and forced him to look at visual stimuli. And they showed a bunch of pictures to this uh, cat. And they were trying to figure out, inside of the brain of this cat, do we see these intermediate features? Are there eye detectors and nose detectors? Is there a cheese detector and a mouse detector somewhere in that brain? that it uses to make its decisions about the world. And actually, what's pretty interesting is that they, uh, and I might get this anecdote a little wrong, but generally the story is, they have this cat sitting there, and they're showing it a bunch of pictures, and they keep putting pictures in, and nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, and all of a sudden they hear it crackle. And they're like, oh, what was on the card? And I have no idea what was on the card. Maybe it's a grasshopper. And they're like, oh, did we find a grasshopper in your eye? When I say there was a crackle, I mean, they literally have a probe into a neuron in the brain. And they're trying to see, when is this neuron fire in response to this visual stimuli? And they keep showing it stuff, and eventually they like, crackle. And they're like, all right, show it something else. You know, there goes a grasshopper. Show it a, a cockroach. And they show it a cockroach, and it crackles. And then they find out this neuron is actually crackling in response to everything, every card we put in there. I'm like, what is going on? This had to, surely this neuron is not so generic as a fire in response to everything. That would be useless. And it turned out that as they were sliding the note card in, that's what was causing it to crackle. It was crackling in response to the transition from a white surface to a dark surface. It was the edge of the car against the black background. <clears throat> so it was a horizontal bar detector, like this. And then they find out, if I rotate the car a little bit, a different neuron crackles. A different neuron will crackle here, here, and here. So there are different neurons that are edge detectors, and they detect different orientation of edges. And for that, they won the Nobel Prize. And set off the search for, like, what are the representations inside the brain? What does each neuron do? So, what's pretty cool is that we hope and think that these deep neural networks are also learning similar edge detectors on the first layer. Uh, and there's actually good evidence that that happens. I'll show you that in a bit. But what we don't know is what happens on the intermediate layers. For technical reasons, I can just tell you that the answer to the first layer is really easy to access. The answer to the rest of the layers is hard. So, um, the overall idea then is that deep learning is modeled after what we think is happening in the brain. First you have edge detectors, then you have corner detectors, then you have eye detectors and nose detectors, etc. There's also a recent paper, uh, I think this is 2005, the site's getting cut off. It's in Nature, uh, 2005, by Kiroga et al. And they basically find grandmother cells. <coughs> which is this idea that's been around for a long time that hasn't been experimentally probed, that inside of a neural network, of a real human neural network, there might be a cell that will respond to my grandmother. And not just one picture of my grandmother, all the different facets of my grandmother. So her in profile, her from back, a picture of her, maybe even her name spelled out. And they started, so they put some probes into some poor people's brains who were having surgery for other reasons. And they started showing them a bunch of pictures, and then all of a sudden, crackle. They're like, what was that? And there's a picture of Halle Berry, of this one neuron. I said, okay, that was this picture of Halle Berry, but I was going to put in another picture of Halle Berry. And every picture of Halle Berry they showed to this neuron, this person, that neuron crackles. And they said, okay, what about other actresses? So they show it Jennifer Anderson, nothing. They said, okay, what about other African American actresses? They show it in Beyonce, although she didn't exist at this time, but uh, maybe. Anyway, uh, nothing, right? And they show, but they do find that a drawing of Halle Berry will light up that neuron. And Halle Berry, wearing, Halle Berry wearing a cat suit will light up that neuron, which is a very different visual stimuli. And here's the kicker. Oh, I can't see it. It's so sad. But the words Halle Berry printed out on a piece of paper and shown to that person causes that same neuron to crack. So that neuron is this abstract representation of the concept of Halle Berry, and it's piping in all of these different visual inputs, text. Maybe if you knew Halle Berry, it would be the smell of Halle Berry. All these different signals together to say, aha, that's the Halle Berry concept, and I light that up, and then maybe I do something with that in my brain. So there's some evidence that that exists in real brains, and the question is, does that exist in neural networks? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So, well, I guess we can talk about that now. So here are some of the scientific questions that we have in my lab. I'm transitioning now to the science portion of the talk, not the cheerleading for deep learning portion of the talk. One of them is, do these deep neural networks do this? Do they do what we hope they'll do? Do they increasingly build High, eight, and more and more abstract concepts uh, throughout the network. And do they have things like this Halle Berry neuron? Is there a neuron in there for car? And it responds to all the different types of cars that are out there. 
Or does it separately memorize each car that it saw, and it can show me a car and just find the nearest looking thing, which would be less impressive. So that kind of begins and kicks off this field that we've jumped into with both feet in our lab, which is this field of what I call AI neuroscience, which is just like neuroscientists, we're trying to figure out how do these things work. You know, neuroscience is trying to figure out a real brain, we're trying to figure out a computational brain. Uh, and it turns out this is quite hard. People really can't wrap their head around this. So I talk to journalists all the time. They're like, I don't understand how you don't know how this thing works. Like, you made it. You have the code. And I'm like, that's true, but it's really complicated. I'll give you the code. Here's 100 million neurons all talking to each other in some crazy pattern. Uh, you know, and here's 1.3 million images in which it does that. You figure out what it's doing. It's very, very difficult. So I'm going to show you some techniques we have, like neuroscientists, to try to reverse engineer what is happening inside these brains that makes them work so well. So why should we do that? Well, first of all, it's just a basic science question. I want to know how this thing works and how it does so well. Uh, it's the same reason we do neuroscience. We couldn't say, ah, human brain, good enough. But no. First, if you're curious, then I don't know how does it do what it does. Uh, I also want to know when this is going to fail. If I'm going to put that on a driverless car, I better know in what situations it's not going to perform very well. Uh, there are also a lot of engineering reasons. I want to make better neural networks, better architectures, better learning algorithms. And also, this is an interesting one. It's also the practical question. If I have a neural network that trains on people's medical in, uh, information or on their credit history and denies them a loan or gives them a loan, I might want to be able to tell that person why it decided that you're not credit worthy. And in fact, there are certain laws specifically with regards to credit that says if you're going to deny someone a loan, you have to tell them why. Well, if you train a deep neural network and you can't look inside it and figure out why it made this decision, you can't use this technology in that domain. Uh, so that's a problem. You also want to make sure that it's not doing things that you don't want it to do. So if a, hire, a neural network for hiring or a neural network for credit apps was using some category like race or gender to make decisions because it's from the data concluding that that is a, a key feature to Keon, and we as society say, no, we don't want you to use that feature. And you have to figure out if that feature has been learned by the network. I just learned yesterday from a journalist from Science that uh, people are thinking about making uh, decisions about parole, whether or not to let people get out of jail, <coughs> based on models that are being learned from data. Because the data is better at predicting mm -hmm. recidivism than humans. But obviously, you can think about how scary that gets uh, if you don't know why the model is making certain decisions. Okay, so how do we do this? This question of what does a neuron do? What features are being learned by the network? How do I figure out what every neuron in the neural network, what is doing, what is learned? Well, there's no easy answer, but we've been developing a series of techniques, and we're one of a couple, a uh, handful of labs that have been working on this. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to take this brain here. We're going to train it to do something like recognize lions. And then I'm going to take a neuron in the brain and I'm, for example, I'm going to take the neuron that reports whether or not it's a lion. Because I actually know that that neuron should detect lions, because that's what I trained it to do. And I can even quantify that. I can show a bunch of lions and say, yep, that neuron lights up. So then I'm going to ask an artist over here to paint a picture and show it to the network. And the network tells me, oh, yeah, that's 2% lion. And I say, okay, the artist. The, the network thought that was 2% lion. We change this a little bit. And we show it to the network, and the network says, oh, now that's 1% line. So go back to the artist and you say, no, no, you made the wrong changes. Make some new changes. And the artist says, okay, make some new changes. Now the network says, oh, that's 5% line. And you say, oh, artist, keep going in that direction. And you cycle this process for a really long time. And what you would hope is that if you do this, you'll get a picture of a line out. And that will tell you, this, this neuron here, what it likes to detect is this thing, which we can see as a line. Okay? Now, that's not that useful for the last layer of neurons, because I already know what those things are supposed to do. But it gets much more interesting if I then ask the, neuro the artist to, look, to make a picture that will light up an intermediate neuron. Because maybe then if the, the artist will find out that that neuron wants to see eyes, and this neuron wants to see mufflers, and things like that. And then I can go through and probe what this network is doing. So that is what a lot of the rest of the talk is going to be about, which is how do we do this effectively? All right, so we call this deep visualization, and here is our first crack at it. So I call it take one. So A is starts as a PhD student, and we decide what are we going to work on, and we say, let's try this. And so we're going to take this deep neural network here, and this network, if I give it a penguin, if I put that in the top of the network, it will spit out, oh, that's a penguin with 99% certainty. It's really sure that that's a penguin. 
Again, you do the same thing for a guitar. Okay? So now I'm going to take the same network. I'm not going to change the weights or learn, do any more learning. I'm just going to leave it fixed. And then I'm going to uh, have an evolutionary algorithm over here, which is an optimization algorithm. It's going to generate a picture at random. I'm going to show it to this network, and the network says, oh, that's 0%, or it's only 0.7% can go in. No, that's not really a guitar. Okay? And then I'm going to change, take this image here, I'm going to make random changes to it, put it back in, make more random changes, and if the activation of the picture gets more and more high for that class, then I'm going to keep it. And if not, I'm going to throw it out. So it's kind of like doing hill climbing in the space of images that will like that neuron up. And if you know more about evolution, you know that that explanation is wrong, but close enough. So we're going to evolve images that light up particular neurons in this network. Now, what do you think that I'm going to get if I do this? What are these going to look like? When I finally have evolution produce a picture that looks 99% like a finger, according to this network, and 99% like a guitar, according to this network, you would expect, and we expect, thin guitars and finger. What do you get? You get this, which is insane. So you can't read it, but on the bottom, this tells you that 99% of all of these images here, sorry, the neural network with 99% confidence is certain that that is an armadillo and that's a panda. Certain, it's absolutely certain. To it, that's as much of a panda as a picture of a panda, or maybe even more so. So we said, okay, maybe the problem is that we're you're evolving pixel by pixel, and in the space of static, that's like too hard or something. So I take a neural, uh, an evolutionary algorithm that I know previously can produce images that this same network can classify as real things. So this and evolution produced this picture, and the neural network says black panther. Evolution produced this, and this is uh, toucan, etc. Now that was with humans doing the selection, where humans said oh, that looks more like a toucan, that looks more like a uh, mask, that looks more like a car. So they use evolution, they evolve the pictures, and then I give it to the neural network and they can see them. Okay, but now I'm not going to have humans do the selection. I'm going to just go back to this picture and have the process happen automatically with evolution doing it. And here's the result. And again, the deep neural network, which just I just showed you, billions of dollars being invested in, does all these amazing things. It is certain that that is a king penguin, and that is a starfish, and that is an electric guitar. 99.5% certain. Well, those don't look like king penguins to me, and electric guitars to me. So, um, we actually stop at this point, uh, and we just say, we have to share this with the world. These neur neural networks are not behaving how we think they are. So, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip one part. We also, that was all with evolution. We can do one more trick to produce these images, which is instead of using evolution to cycle here, I can actually calculate the math with respect to the input image. And say, if I do the derivative of each pixel, how do I change this pixel to light up the line neuron more? And how do I change this pixel and this pixel and this pixel? So I can kind of climb in image space to light up that neuron. It's a, more, it's a different technique. Then what I get are these pictures. And again, the network is 99, in this case 99.9% .9 certain that that is a gorilla, and that is a cliff dwelling, that's a bikini, and that's a Britney Spaniel. And they don't look like that, obviously. So these networks are being fooled in some sense. So we stop and write this paper. Deep neural networks are easily fooled. Uh, and we share this with the world, that basically the network thinks that that's a school bus with 99% certainty. So that's a problem if you're putting it on and driving this car, because you might have a person with a rugby shirt that has that pattern on it, and the car suddenly slams on the brakes because it thinks it's uh, passing a, running into a school bus. So we wanted to point out two things in this paper. One is that this is a huge security concern. Uh, because that means these networks are hackable. If I have a camera that's learned to detect President Obama and open up the White House door, and I can put on some static on my shirt that's been tuned to have fool the camera, then I can get in the White House without looking like Obama. Same thing with, uh, you can imagine somebody bring, uh, paying for some billboards like this just to throw off Google's driverless car, or something like that. We also just wanted to point out, it's interesting that AI seems to be worth seeing the world differently. Why is that? Uh, now, just because to, just to, to, we're scientists, we said, let's check it on some other data. So we take a network, and we train it to recognize handwritten digits. This actually is the technology that reads your checks for you automatically. <coughs> and uh, it's 99% accurate at recognizing handwritten digits. And then I say, all right, synthesize for me the images that light up the one neuron or the zero neuron. And here they all are. Again, with two different types of evolution. So it is certain that's an eight. Positive. And it clearly is. 
Now you might say, well, okay, maybe it's just this type of image you've never seen before. So put these in the training set as negative examples. Say, don't call those eights and ones and fours, and retrain the network. Well, we tried that, and basically things don't get any better. It will learn that those aren't, that's not a nine, but then next time I can produce that as a nine. And the confidence doesn't go down by adding all of these as negative examples, I can still produce new things that it's never seen before. It's an endless R trace. This is also quite scary and crazy, but if I train one network here to go from picture to lion, I train a different neural network to do the same thing. So this is my network in my company. You have a different architecture, a different learning algorithm, maybe a different data set, and you've trained your brain. Well, I can produce this starfish on my brain, show it to your brain, and your brain says starfish. That's crazy. That means that this process isn't learning to hack some particular idiosyncrasy of that brain. It's discovering some general property about how artificial intelligence sees the world that's, that's generalizing across different AIs. And they're all kind of, it's almost like the AIs are sitting there having a lecture hall where they're like, these silly humans don't know that that's a starfish. Like, what, are they, what are they doing? It's so clearly a starfish. They all agree on it, which is crazy. So that's problematic because it means that maybe your AI is closed source on your White House camera. And you don't give me access to it, so I can't run evolution or this mathematical technique to generate the image. But I can do it on my own brain, and then I can put it on my shirt and walk right through the front door. Which is kind of scary. So, um, uh, this is somebody who took our paper and literally took their own in-house. This is a startup in California called Vicarious. They have their own computational brains, and they've been working on it for years. They've raised like $50 million in venture capital. And they were sure that their networks wouldn't be fooled by our... Uh, you know, in the same way, because their networks are better than the networks we worked on. And Aang went there and gave a talk, and they took out their uh, their iPhone app, and they pointed it at our picture. And sure enough, oh, uh, you can't see, oh yeah, up here. So this, our fooling image from digital clock, their thing also says 80% digital clock. And same thing for green stage and stethoscope. So it really is translating across these different uh, networks. So uh, this paper just kind of went viral, it went crazy. People were uh, really interested in these results. And I forgot to say this earlier, but I'm going to check modesty at the door for this talk because partly I'm so excited about the awesome work that AIM has done that I want to be very clear about uh, how good it is. But also because you know this is the engineering initiative and we want to make sure our money's been well spent, I want to show you the impact that Tier 1 Excellence Funds have had on the world. So this paper that I put, this deep neural networks are easily fooled, was the 63rd most talked about scientific paper in any country in any discipline worldwide last year, and it came out of you know, Tier 1 funded AIM's work. We also had articles in The Economist, The Atlantic, Wire, New Scientist, Scientific American Mind, MIT Technology Review, etc., etc. Uh, this is Larry Page, the founder of Google, who this New Yorker columnist and neuroscience professor decided he needed to tell Larry about this, so he literally printed it on his shirt with this phrase, don't worry, killer robot, I'm just a starfish, and uh, went and got a selfie with Larry Page. Uh, this is Aang presenting to the CBPR conference. So it didn't just make waves in the public domain, but it also academically has been well received. This is the top conference in computer vision. It's a huge room of thousands and thousands of people that he presented this paper to. Because the paper was given an uh, oral presentation, which only 3% of papers submitted to the conference were given. And it was also the winner of a Best Paper Award, for which they gave us $3,000. So we're going to take and send Aang to Deep Learning Summer School uh, with it also has over 100 citations, even though it's less than a year old, which is, um, which is nice. So, I also want to point out a side issue, which I don't have time to get into, but this same technique can also therefore be an, art, art, an artificial intelligence artist, or an automatic art generator, right? Because it just automatically produces these images. And what I didn't tell you is that sometimes the images look, uh, look relatively sensible. So this is the AI's interpretation of a television, a matchstick, a bagel, prison, etc. And they're kind of interesting and different. And so we actually took these images here, and we said, those kind of look interestingly interested in, interestingly different. And so we decided, we're like, I wonder if people would actually consider those art. So we saw an email come out here at the University of Wyoming for an art competition. We're over at the art museum, the fine arts students who are practicing their projects all year and doing their artwork, they submit their stuff to the museum. And then there's this competition, and the museum accepts 35% of the pieces, uh, and if your work is accepted, then they put it on the wall. And not only did this piece, which we did not tell them was made by a computer, not only was this accepted as a piece of art on its own merit, but it was given one of the awards at the art show, which we thought was kind of fun. 
Uh, again, a side note I don't have time to tell you about much, but this, this work also is informing this whole other field of evolutionary algorithms and evolutionary theory uh, in ways which, which is because the same idea can be used in any domain. So instead of having it automatically produce endless streams of art or pictures, I could have it produce endless streams of engineering solutions like better plane wings or better blades for uh, wind turbines or robots that can do backflips and cartwheels. And so Aang and I submitted this paper to the biggest conference in evolutionary computation last year, and it won uh, a best paper award, which is a 3% acceptance rate. But I don't have time to tell you about that. So uh, that kind of gets us back to this question, which you're probably wondering, which is why. Why are these networks so easily fooled? You just told me they were so good, and we should all jump and start using them. And now you're telling me that I can fool them with the drop of a hat. Why is that happening? Well, uh, it's somewhat complicated, and the theory we're developing is ongoing. And already we've ruled out some ideas, and we've had and developed new ones. The general idea, though, is imagine this. Ultimately, what a neural network is doing is it's trying to tell apart these data points from these data points. Now, I'm showing this in 2D. It's really in, you know, uh, really high dimensional spaces, but the uh, same idea applies. It has to put a line between blue and yellow, right? Now, if I say to that thing, I want you know to produce the bluest possible point, I'm going to have a process that generates dots that you are certain are blue. It's not going to put it right there. It's not going to put it near the data, which means it's not going to make an image that looks realistic. It's going to put the point all the way down there, which is really far away from the line, and therefore might be really unnatural. An image that looks nothing like the type of image that we tend to see in the world. And maybe that's why we get all these weird fooling images. If I could instead say, don't just make me something that's as blue as possible, but make me something that's blue, but also is nearby the points that you trained on, nearby the real world data, then maybe I would get more realistic images. <laughs> so, uh, that's one theory that we have. Now, one interesting prediction of this is that if this is true, this theory, then if I can do that, I start, I redo uh, the synthesizing process, and I tell the artist, don't just make the bluest point possible, make a blue point, but also keep the point similar to the other data points, like make the image look natural and make it light up that neuron, then I probably would not get fooling images. So if this theory is right, and if we do that, then we won't get these fooling images. There's another theory, though, which is our, was our original theory when we had this paper. And that is that maybe the network isn't learning really what a school bus is. Maybe it doesn't know a school bus has wheels and a windshield and all these windows, etc. Maybe it just figures out one unique tell, a unique characteristic that belongs to school buses that doesn't exist in any other category, such that if I see horizontal yellow and black lines, call it a school bus. So it's not really learning what we think it's learning, which means this, this technology is much less impressive than we thought, even though it works. Same thing here. It might just learn or like this texture and this texture is enough for a starfish without seeing there's a body with five legs. So this hypothesis says that even if I tell evolution, make a point that you think is a starfish and looks natural, it won't actually produce, it will still produce a fooling image because it won't know the structure. It never learned the overall structure of a bus or a starfish. So let's find out. We're going to try that. So I want to remind you, this was take one of what we call deep visualization. I'm synthesizing these images to um, produce, to light up a neuron. I'm going to stick with the third of those techniques, the one where we use the math. It's more data efficient. We're just going to synthesize images that light up these neurons using that calculus instead of using evolution. Now, that was take one. So now I'm going to try saying to the artist, your job is not just to light up the neuron. Don't just produce a picture that lights up that neuron. But also, try to keep your try to keep your image, make it look natural. Keep it close to the other data points. If anybody else has a laser pointer, I'll take it. No. Okay. So we're gonna do that. Now the artist has two goals, right? And we call these natural image pliers because the artist has to make the image look natural. It has some prior knowledge or bias for what the image should look like. And here is what it looks like. This is the only thing I'm showing you that wasn't done, wasn't lead authored by Aang, since he's a third author in this case. But we added some of these biases to try to make the images look more natural. And you can now start to see 
There's some pool table shade that kind of looks like a swan. There's a school bus, and oh, it, maybe it does look a little, learn a little bit more of the structure of a school bus. But then we said, OK, maybe we can do even better priors. And I'm skipping over the technical details. I'm not telling you how we implement these priors. But this is uh, something we just did in review right now at a conference. I want to point out that take one was 2015. This was also 2015. And this paper is in review now in 2016. So this is all happening very fast. But now we're starting to see within that inside these neurons, it has actually learned the structure of the space. So you can see this really starts to look like a jack-o'-lantern or candles, or an hourglass, or a wedding dress. Thanks, Hank. Or thanks, you. So um, we were, I was ecstatic and over the moon to finally see these images, because this kind of rules out that hypothesis that says that these aren't learning the global structure. It is the case that this network really does know that that is uh, a pumpkin. And if we synthesize it and we don't say, you know, go off in crazy land, but stay near the natural data, I can synthesize images that led the neuron, and it really would show me that that's a pumpkin. Now, again, for every one of these cases, I know the answer, right? I know the category. Now, Aang, just the other day, I think two days ago, he sent me his newest results, even better priors, better biases, and this is the result. And I, my jaw just dropped when I saw this. Oops, sorry. Because you can really start to see what these images look like. Again, this is, I take a, imagine if I can take your brain, go in there and find a neuron, and just say, oh, that neuron, it cares about bread, or lemon, or lawnmowers. It's pretty incredible technology. So here are more. I can't get enough of looking at these things. Here's a mask. Here's a stove, a joystick, a boathouse. A bird, and these are just synthesized. These are the pictures. This is the platonic form of what this neural network thinks a planetarium looks like. It's pretty crazy. Now, as I mentioned, none of that's that interesting when I already knew what the neuron did. But now I can use the same technology and delve into the network and say, what were the things being learned at each layer in the network? So let's do that. Here are pictures for a subset of neurons that lay each one of these layers. At the very lowest layer, just as Hubble and Wiesel found, there are edge detectors. This thing will detect the transition from white to dark, and this one from dark to light. The, one layer up, we start to see corners and edges. Three layers up, I now see landscapes, and this is like a mountain scene detector. This is a water detector. This might be under uh, the top of a mushroom detector. If I go up a layer, now I have some kind of bird feathery detectors. This might be in the eye of like a dog, like a large dog. I don't know. Here's a, maybe a bird, maybe a bucket. Layer One layer or two layer up, things start to get really weird. And we're actually, we don't know what's happening here. We're, just, we're actively trying to figure out what are these neurons doing. This looks like in our dog faces on bathtubs, clocks, <laughs> our, like arches of wood over water. It's just like totally bizarre, like a turtle with an eye. I have no idea. And then we get up to the top layer where we do know the answer, and now they're starting to look like ostriches and restaurant scenes with lots of detail, which is pretty incredible. So uh, one other goal we had is, OK, you can take this ostrich neuron, or any other neuron, and you can light up. You can produce one image that lights it up. But I don't really want to see one image that lights it up. I want to know all of the things that that neuron will respond to. Because I want to know, is that a Halle Berry neuron, or is that an African-American actress neuron? So if you can synthesize all of the images that light it up, maybe I'll see that there are many different actresses in there and what they have in common, and therefore I'll learn what that neuron does. So we call this multifaceted feature visualization, and Aang has done all of this work as well. So here are real images from the bell pepper class. And the neural network can call all of these things bell peppers. And I'm going to synthesize these. Now, these are different images that all light up that same neuron. And you can say, oh, that neuron is willing to respond to red peppers and green peppers and yellow peppers and orange peppers. And I can learn the space of things that that neuron uh, wants to see. Here's a movie theater. And you can see uh, this is a bunch of seats and a screen in the inside of the building. That same neuron has recognized that just to call it a movie theater when it sees it from the outside with a blue sky day. Uh, and these are images from the training set. Here are cars, and it learned to recognize different colored cars, et cetera. So um, the final thing that I uh, wanted to tell you about, I can't really show you the full video. I'll just show you a little bit of it, 
is we built this tool where you can take one of these networks live, and it's actually up in the Barry Center right now. You can go play with it. Uh, and you can look at each neuron at each le le uh, level with a webcam, and it will show you what those neurons are responding to and what they want to see. Uh, and you can say, oh, this, is, this neuron is a face detector, this neuron, here's like that edge detector that goes from light to dark and dark to light, two different ones. I want to show you one more cool one, which is a face detector. So this neuron here is learning to detect faces, and you can see Jason's face here. It, it'll tell you, it'll identify where that is in the image. And then in a second here, I'll pop up, let's see, just to show you that it can detect two faces at the same time. Which is kind of fun. So, uh, some blue sky ideas in future work and I'll conclude. One is that I'm talking to John Fraser. I told you I gave a lecture in the neuroscientist group last week. And he has birds that have very specific neurons that will only respond to their mate, their partner's song. So a bird knows a particular song. Can I take his electrode into that bird, use evolution, and synthesize the song that will light that neuron up? And therefore, I can figure out what, 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 like how much variance in that song will this bird tolerate before it won't hook up with another bird? Obviously, that's a blue sky idea, but uh, it would be fascinating to do that. Uh, we have some other work on deep learning that I don't have time to tell you about, but the papers are on our website. Uh, we have ongoing work in our lab on this field, so um, Aang is trying to now use this tool that he's built to actually understand these networks and figure out uh, how to improve them. Uh, Chris Stanton is in the back here. He's trying to improve reinforcement learning, which is what was used here. Uh, and um, Mohammed, who is also here, he is trying to help these networks be able to learn multiple different skills and tasks. I'll also uh, grant out with um, Matt Kaufman over in Zoology, who runs the co-op unit there. Where what we want to do, this is also with people from Africa who have the biggest network of cameras out in the field in the Serengeti taking pictures of animals. And they currently have humans label each animal. And then they can gather data, oh, this is how many wildebeest walk through this field. But we want to automatically do all that with these deep neural networks. And then in Wyoming, right now, the method for counting animals is you have a helicopter and you literally fly around and you count, which is really expensive way to gather data. So what Matt wants to do is put up cameras on migration corridors, snap these pictures once a second, and they will automatically identify them and just have Wyoming turn into big, big data collection of all the big game, and then we can analyze that data much more cheaply. Uh, we just also submitted a grant to the NSF with these players, where we are basically saying there's many different research groups on campus, some of them I see in this room, that want to harness this technology, or at least harness GPUs, which is a similar uh, piece of equipment, to accelerate their own research labs. So UW, we hope, is going to get more involved in building up equipment, expertise, and talent in this area. So the overall conclusions that I want to leave you with is that the gold rush is on. It's a scientific gold rush, and it's an economic gold rush, because now we have AI that works, and what can't we do with that? I mean, every field can imagine, I want to use that to improve what it is that I'm doing. Um, but I do believe that it is not an overstatement to say that it will revolutionize every single scientific field and sector of AI. Uh, and that's, that's a big statement, but I stand by it. So I think UW should be investing in it. Uh, I also want to just scientifically point out that Aang's work shows that reverse engineering these networks is hard but possible, and it kind of creates this field of AI neuroscience, which is a quest that we used to leave and been embarking on. The last slide of the talk, I just want to say that um, Aang is a tier one funded excellence fellow, so I think our dollars are going to good purpose. Uh, here. He started in the fall of 2014, which means he has not yet finished his third semester. He already has five papers, three that have been published, two that have been reviewed, with tremendous worldwide impact of his work. That's in addition to the fact that he got invited to do the internship at Apple, uh, so he had to take a summer off of research to do that. And so instead of concluding this talk by having you guys give me an applause, I would like to conclude this talk by having all of us give a
because it's hard. It's a hard problem to say, I, you know, here's a neuron, light it up, and you have to produce a photorealistic image. And as you see, we're getting better and better at producing photorealistic image. You're saying at the beginning it didn't work and at the end it did, what was the difference? Is that what you're asking? Well, for all teenagers, we actually used the final. The ones that got submitted in the art gallery used that evolution. And sometimes it produced sensible stuff that looked really good. Sometimes it's using abstract patterns. And we had basically two papers that came out of that result. One of them was, hey, half the time this doesn't work. And this is, the network is saying that this thing is a starfish, even when it's with a starfish. That's a problem. But half the time it does work, and that means that it's interesting as an automatic art generator, or as an algorithm that can produce solutions in any domain. And so we actually took the same basic result, published it to two different computers. So how do you look at the activation of each neuron in the image? Do you look at the rate and the rate of changing the neuron that are being activated? Or how do you look at the immediate? So when we're synthesizing the image for a particular brain, we're not changing the weights of that brain. It's not doing any more learning. And uh, basically, you can actually, you have all the data. You run an image through a network, and you see how each neuron, whether it fires and how strongly it fires. You just know that. And so I can take a neuron, I can show it an input, and it can say, oh, that, that activated at, at 0.3. I show it a different image, and it says, oh, that activated at 0.5. And that's how we do the evolutionary process. We say, produce things that increasingly activate it, and stop when it's maximally active. And that's what I showed. Yeah. So in this slide, the initial images were there, that they were seeing different images. How did you generate that? Because you were seeing the location of the image detection, black to white, black to black. So basically, you're getting output from each layer, right? Yep. So, it's a, so we basically, we take this network, almost there, one more, there. We take a network, and it might have, on this layer here, it might have, I don't know, 5,000 neurons, okay? I'm going to take one of those neurons here, and I'm going to run a whole process to, to synthesize the image that that neuron wants to fire in response to. And it turns out that neuron cares about fire. I'm going to then take the next neuron over and synthesize it, and that neuron responds to that. I actually don't know what that, that is. <laughs> but this one cares about the things. And then I'll do a separate process for this neuron, and this neuron, and this neuron. And then I'll put them all together on one sheet and show it to you. So that neuron actually will fire Whenever you show the image of a fire, no matter what, right? Like if it's a big fire, a small fire, it's a candle, like uh, the you show different images of the fire to yes. figure out. That's right. That's right. In fact, so that is another technique that allows you to figure out what these neurons do. So for example, this in this toolbox we built, these are the images that we synthesize that activate this face detector. And you can kind of see it's a face looking thing with a shirt. This is take two, by the way. We haven't updated it with our best results. So you can see a much more accurate face here with any results. But we can also take that same neuron and show it every single image in the entire data set and take the top nine images that light that neuron up from the real data set. And that's these images. And you can see that they all are um, people have faces in them. And you might say, okay, well, why not just do that? Why don't we do all the pain to do that? And the answer is because sometimes it's not very clear. So later on in this video, we show you this neuron here, right? And the top nine images that light it up are all kind of caps or circles with text. So you might say, oh, that's a circle text detector. Or maybe even that's just a cap detector. But actually, when you synthesize these images, and these ones aren't that good of you, uh, you can discover, or when you use the webcam, that this is actually a text detector. So what it cares about is seeing words. And there are words of different colors, different fonts, different orientations, and that's what it cares to see. And it just so happens that these also all have words on them. So maybe you wouldn't have known that the thing in here that it cares about is the word part, not the cat part. So to some extent, none of these tools are perfect. You kind of use all of them to triangulate in and figure out what is this neuron. There's lots of questions. I'll start with the features. So basically, 
train the neural network is an optimization problem. Yep. And, and so you do that, or do you, I mean, how do you do that? So that isn't that, um, if you remember the slide that had the vertical network and like the 